Playoff basketball is intense. It's gritty. It's hard. And it appears to be the right ankle of Kyrie Irving. Next, of course, have had their share of injuries all season long. We lost a great player during the game. It was a big adjustment tonight to play without him. Giannis on the slam! Welcome to the playoffs. Both these teams getting after it. That's typical playoff basketball. Gets it going. Oh, beautiful feed right through the <laughs> wicket. Love the way the guys play. We just got to keep competing. Giannis up and over the top. Middleton for three. Puts it in. We're very happy, but we got to keep getting better. Hopefully, we can go in Brooklyn and take one. Hello, what is going on, everybody? Welcome into First Take on a Monday. I'm Charlie Arnold. We got. Freddie Coleman in Bristol joining us. My girl Monica McNutt right here in studio. Doesn't it feel so good? I could almost be, reach out and Almost. Touch. Almost. One day. One day we'll be able to hold hands here. Freddie, we wish you were here with us. But guys, we have a lot to get to because we are coming off some big conference final, semifinal games from last night in the NBA. Unfortunately for the Nets, they are experiencing more of the same from the entire season, really, and not being injuries. The big three down to one in last night's game four against the Bucks after Kyrie left the game with a sprained right ankle midway through the second. He went up for a layup, came down hard on Giannis's foot. Now there is the distinct possibility of both Harden and Kyrie being out for game five. So the load will fall to KD if this is the case, who last night held to nine for 25 from the field. Here's Steve Nash after the game. Yeah, uh, Kai, uh, x-rays were negative, but uh, we'll have to see how it goes uh, tomorrow and further tests and, and treatment. Um, yeah, obviously, obviously we, we lost a great player uh, during the game, which was tough. We all got to pitch in. We all got to play together. We got to move the ball. And, and I thought tonight we got a little single-minded, looking for Kevin every time. Puts a little bit too much pressure on him. It makes it a little more predictable, I thought, um, you know, which, which puts a lot of burden on him. All right, final score last night, 107 to 96. Freddie, we'll start with you here. Can Durant win a game without the other two members of the big three? I don't believe so because you look at that starting five that he has. This is the worst starting five in a playoff game that Kevin Durant has ever been a part of. I mean, think about this. This may be the worst starting five that Kevin Durant's ever been a part of since his first year in Seattle. When you take out a Kyrie Irving and a James Harden, we don't know, even if Kyrie Irving plays in game five, what kind of compromise situation is he going to be in because a lot of his games is based on movement. He's got to have that movement, that great handle, that great dribble. And now you have to have Joe Harris and Blake Griffin play out of their minds. I'm not buying that from that standpoint. Unless Kevin Durant scores 81 like a Kobe Bryant did not too long ago, that's the only, only way that I believe that he'll be able to do that and win a game without those two guys. You're expecting guys who know their roles to go above their roles, and it's great as Kevin Durant is. Now he's got to be a playmaker, facilitator, leader. Well, we've wondered about there, Kevin Durant, at least I have from the standpoint point of that. You don't have to worry about being a leader on the basketball team because that's why he went to the Brooklyn Nets and why he was suited for that role to be with this team and letting somebody else do that. Well, now that has to fall on him, and he has to do with the guys that I mentioned when it comes to guys that have to play above their roles. So as great as he is, unless he scores like 81 points, I don't believe he can win one game without – Kyrie Irving, and also James Harden. Who knows we're going to see those two guys for the rest of this series against the Milwaukee Bucks. You don't think KD can get a single game, Freddie? While 81, I know, is a bit of hyperbole, right? Sure. In theory, KD does have the skill set that would allow him to do that. Here's what I think is different from compared to some of those teams that maybe didn't have as stout a supporting cast as we've seen KD be a part of in, in Golden State or even Oklahoma City if you want to go that far back. KD has grown tremendously, right? I think he is a better basketball player than he was when he got into the league. I think he understands the magnitude of the moment. And quite honestly, if Jason Tatum can get you 50 to allow a Boston Celtics squad get a victory versus the Brooklyn Nets with two of their three superstars on the court, I believe that KD does have the superstar caliber DNA that he could help elevate this team to that moment. And furthermore, beyond that, I don't know that I trust the Bucks that much that it is out of the realm of possibility. A single game, Kevin Durant can do that for you. He is that caliber talent. Now, the series, that's a different story because I do think that the Bucks uh, can continue to make adjustments and make it very difficult for him. But mm -hmm. my good friend Justin Tinsley at The Undefeated has this uh, mathematical equation for playoff series. Two, one, one. And two being your superstar has to carry you and get those two wins. And then your supporting cast get that one and one. If Kawhi Leonard can do it for the Clippers, I think Kevin Durant can get it done for the Brooklyn Nets. Not that it's an easy task, but one game, I think KD can give me that. You are, I'm going to use these numbers. 
Milwaukee has two to Kevin one, Kevin Durant's one. And those two dudes right now, Chris Middleton and Giannis Antetokounmpo, are going to be better than that one with, Ke with Ke Kevin Durant. That means you're telling me, Monica, that Kevin Durant is going to match their production, which means 68 points. He's not going to be able to do that. And right now, Chris Middleton and also Giannis Antetokounmpo have a better supporting cast right now than Kevin Durant. I'm not trusting that Joe Harris, who's been one for the series so far from the three-point line, is also going to find that touch, especially when everybody's going to load up on Kevin Durant and you're going to have to have the ability to make shots. And Joe Harris has shown so far in this series that he can't shake loose from that defense. And even when he was been wide open like he was in game three, he was not able to knock down shots. Those two guys right now, Giannis Antetokounmpo and Chris Middleton, are not going to face the defensive pressure from the Brooklyn Nets the way that Kevin Durant is going to face from the Milwaukee Bucks defense. Because I know if I'm Milwaukee, if I'm Mike Budenholzer, I'm loading up my defense saying, Kevin, you're not going to do anything. We're going to double and triple team you, which means that Blake Griffin will have to go back into the hot tub time machine and be Blake Griffin when he won the slam dunk competition. <laughs> and then that Joe Harris is going to have to win the three-point shooting contest running away. That's a lot to ask from those two guys to replace Kyrie Irving and even James Harden, even come near their production to give yourself a chance if Kevin Durant's going to go above the number that he's going to have to go above to find a way to make sure this is not a 3-2 series and going back to game six down 3-2 against Milwaukee. Freddie, where we agree is that it would be certainly a tall task. And I happen to believe that the Slim Reaper is up to get it done, easy money sniper. But I will say this, how quickly we forget that we are only two games removed from mm -hmm. the Milwaukee Bucks looking, um, let's just go with crazy in the first two rounds, right? Like, I don't know that I buy that they have completely turned over a leaf and that Middleton and Giannis Antetokounmpo can continue to make up for, what, 76% of their offensive uh, production. So, while I think that we agree in that it being a tall task, I'm not necessarily sold that the Bucks are so fortified that we can't see them have a hiccup that resembles those terrible performances of game two. Now, listen, a series is a long, what, seven games potentially? Mm -hmm. So I'm just not that convinced that the Bucks are that stout and locked in the rest of the way. I think Kevin Durant can carry it. Shooters got to shoot to make shots, and shooters shoot got, have to shoot to get hot. And so for me, Joe Harris, Landry Shamit, Jeff Green obviously back on the floor in the most recent game for the first time in a long time. All those guys have to continue to keep playing. And what we did see from the supporting cast for this Brooklyn Nets squad in the absence of all three of their stars is that they are willing to play hard. I think some of the nuggets in terms of the wins that this Nets team came without those big three. Obviously, we know they didn't play a ton of games. So those guys are capable of playing hard and getting after it for you. I am not sold that Giannis and Chris Middleton are so far gone that KD can't catch them. If some of those guys show up just a little bit. Monica, one, a little bit. They don't have to show up a little bit. You're right. They're going to play hard. They better produce hard. It's not about playing hard. But You're supposed to be playing hard at this point. But producing hard, that's asking a lot from the people you just mentioned. Whether it's whether it's Michael Mike Jones, whether it's Landry Shamit, whether it's all those guys. Now you're asking them to go above and beyond what they've been able to do in what could be an elimination game for the Brooklyn Nets. Because if they don't win game five, they're not winning game six in Milwaukee. This series is going to be over, and the Milwaukee Bucks are going to be on their way to the Eastern Conference Finals. I'm a faithful man, Monica, and I know you're a faithful woman, but that's way too much faith. Out of what the congregation say, the church doors are open. Please help the oh Brooklyn Nets. Goodness. That's Listen, asking a lot of faith for those guys. It is asking a lot. I'm not saying that it's not asking a lot, but every athlete everywhere will say, just give me an opportunity. I'm just not going to rule it out because I'm not sold that the Bucks have turned up this corner and will never look like they're susceptible to catching an L again. That's all I'm saying. You got KD. Give me guys that are going to play hard. The playoffs are a funny thing. We've seen teams jump up and avoid complete sweeps and make a gentleman sweeps and so on and so forth. Give me KD. I've got a chance. That's why I am with it, Freddie. Okay, so let's break it down. According to Freddie, KD needs to score 81 points. He Griffin needs to jump in the hot tub time machine. <laughs> also, we'll need to see less from Giannis because this was his 14th playoff game with 20 paints, 20 points in the paint. There we go. But what do you say now we switch it over to the Western Conference where it was a clean sweep for the Phoenix Suns, a task made easier after we saw the league MVP get tossed, getting slapped with a flagrant two after taking a wild swipe at Suns guard Cameron Payne. Players around the league stunned following the Joker's ejection. Trey Young chiming in saying, a flagrant two? Wow. And John Morant, he just said two words, but they spoke very loudly. He said, league <laughs> soft. Okay, Freddie, what do you say? Is the league soft? The NBA is not soft. The NBA is what the NBA is. And the reason that people will use that word soft is because they're so used to what happened when they grew up watching basketball in the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. The NBA has made sure they're going to legislate, and they have legislated, slug it out, clutch and grab basketball. So anything that goes beyond that pale, 
because the referees have been instructed to make sure the game does not get out of hand. Now, let's be honest, ladies. Players don't want to fight. There's way too much money. If a dude wants to fight, that means he's more of a G League player than the NBA player. He's not going to be around long. But in this situation, after the referees, I thought they allowed the rules of engagement in the NBA to override the decision making. When did sense be taken out of the equation? They have no Nikola Jokic, Jokic, excuse me, making a play in the basketball. And yes, it was a play that was beyond the pale. But a flagrant two, to me, at worst, it should have been a technical foul. You shoot two free throws, boom, let's play basketball. But the league is not too soft because the NBA has made it a point to say, we're going to allow players to be basketball players. You shouldn't have to go to a weight room and be a better basketball player or be a better defender. But I honestly thought that the rules of the NBA, because people say it's soft because what they saw last night, they say, well, back in the day, back when we were just roaming the earth as old people playing basketball <laughs> and we didn't want these kind of things to happen. All of a sudden now, this is not part of the NBA and people thinking we liked it better. Did you really like it better when games were 70 to 69, 80 to 79 and shooting percentages no more than 40%? Give me this. I thought the referees are overzealous with the call, but I will say this. The NBA is not soft. The NBA is what it is. And I don't mind the NBA being this kind of NBA in this day and age. It is particularly interesting, Freddie and Charlie, that uh, Trey Young and John Morant, who I love, shout out to Memphis, who showed love after I picked the Memphis Grizzlies to beat the, Phoenix, or beat the Golden State Warriors. You were um, the only one. Uh, you, you know. You know, I'm here. Like, I'm here. We here. Um, <laughs> we here. <laughs> the, it's interesting that these two guys chimed in on this, right? They are two slight point guards, right? Mm -hmm. They're not big guys. Um, ja goes to the rim with reckless abandon and Kakeles, who was waiting for him on the other side. And of course, Trey is one that draws the commentary, that's not a foul or that's not basketball, very often because of his ability to hunt for fouls and opportunities to get to the free throw line. So it's interesting hearing this from them. I, I do agree with you, Freddie, in that I take a little bit of issue with the word soft. The yeah. game obviously now has been uh, catered to the offensive players, and we love high-scoring affairs. Uh, in this moment, it felt to me that Nikola Jokic was being treated as a player who has a reputation of dirty plays. Now, technically, because my folks on Twitter flagrant too, as I may read really quickly, unnecessary and excessive contact committed by a player against an opponent, right? Right. It was a basketball play. Right. Yes, he was frustrated. There was a little bit of a wind-up. But it was a basketball play. Nikola Jokic is trying to slap the ball away from campaign. I also think that we have to be mindful of looking at things in slow motion, right? Because if, if my face turned right now, Freddie, and I gave you a mean side eye, like, uh -oh. in slow that. motion? You don't want that. Listen, want it's going to look way more intense than in yeah. real time. And so I think while technology is designed for us to get the best look possible, I agree with you that we've taken a little bit of judgment out of the game. And I'm the daughter of a referee, right? Mm -hmm. I do think that it is unfortunate that in this moment you're talking about your MVP and elimination game. It was a what? It was an 85 73. Right. It was an eight point ball game at that point. I got the score wrong but it was an eight point ball game. It is unfortunate to me that the stripes have become a part of the conversation about what should have been maybe the Nuggets opportunity to avoid getting swept. So I don't know that I would agree with the league is soft but right. I do think that that call lacked a little bit of attack and and reading the room in terms of the moment. Yeah, use your head if you're an NBA referee because we know this, and we can say this out loud. If campaign had done that to Nikola Jokic, he's not being thrown out of this game. This is a case of a bigger man against a smaller player, mm -hmm. and they saw that. It reminded me so much of Shaquille O'Neal when somebody said, well, Shaquille O'Neal can take getting fouled. I'm thinking, well, a foul's a foul. I don't care if you're eight foot two or two foot eight. A foul is still a foul. Just because he's a big man doesn't mean he should have to endure more punishment from smaller people beating up on him. I thought this was a reverse situation. If Nikola Jokic was the same size as campaign, let's say he was Devin Booker, there's mm -hmm. no way that mm -hmm. Devin Booker is thrown out of this game. And to be fully honest, even Nikola Jokic stays in the game, they're still getting swept because Phoenix was that good in the fourth quarter. At one point, Chris Paul made nine straight shots. Yeah. They ran the same play. They ran the, what I call the DOI offense, ladies. Definition of insanity. They ran the same mm. thing over and over again. And Denver says, we well, that. it worked the first seven times. It won't work number eight. Well, it worked the first eight times. It won't work number nine. So they wouldn't have won this series or got not avoided being swept, even the Kola Jokic's on the floor. But I thought he was the punishment uh, because he was a bigger guy. Cameron Payne is not a bigger mm -hmm. guy. And I thought they took that rule too literally to the point it should have just been a flagrant one, technical foul, two free throws, and let's play basketball. Yeah. Well, if you were on Twitter, you, you saw what Stephen A. had to say about this call by the refs. He was not about it. <laughs> uh, now the Joker is only the second MVP to be ejected from a postseason game. Steph Curry was the first back in the 2000, 2016 NBA Finals. You remember he took his mouthpiece out, threw it into the stands. 
it hit a fan. So this is only the second player in 25 seasons, by the way, to have that happen. All right, now we move on because the Joker's absence led to some smooth sailing for the Suns, who swept the Nuggets out of the playoffs 123 to 98. Chris Paul, he did the damn thing. The 36 year old went off for 37 points. He's now just four wins away from his first ever NBA Finals appearance. Chris was saying before the game, he, he ain't never sw- swept somebody. Um, he ain't never beat anybody 4-0. Um, and I don't know when the last time the Suns have been to the Western Conference Finals, but you know tonight is one of them nights that you know we celebrate in house, and then you know we wake up tomorrow, and you know we're on to either the Clippers or, or Utah. A couple years ago. They was writing me off, you can't do this, and this ain't about me, it's about us. Show you what you can do when you come together as a team. We got a great team over there, and it's a lot of, a lot of fun to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Chris Paul, you got to love him. Yeah. You saw the hug he gave to Monty Williams after the game. That was, that was something. Uh, Freddie, I have to ask you, though, would Chris Paul be a top five point guard of all time should he win a chip? No, because he's a top five point guard already now, whether he wins a championship or not. Okay. I don't think a ring, <laughs> I don't think a ring is going to make him less of a top five point guard or more of a top five point guard. And I get it. People always attach championship rings to people's legacy. How many did you win? How many did you not win? Well, John Stockton is in my top five point guards of all time. He didn't win a championship ring. Isaiah Thomas, one of the greatest point guards ever. I split hairs between him and Chris Paul. I got between four and five. I got Magic one, Oscar two, Stockton three. Then I got a tie between Chris Paul and also um, and also Isaiah Thomas. I'll split, the, I'll split the difference. I'll say Isaiah Thomas is number four and Chris Paul is number five. But whether they win a championship or not, you can't discount what he's been able to do no matter where he's been, whether he was drafted by New Orleans or with the Clippers, and they blamed him for their fall. The Houston Rockets, they tried to blame him for that fall when it wasn't his fault. At the same time, the fact that he's been able to do this when people were trying and determined to write him off three, four, five years ago, he was a top five point guard period to me. So no matter what he does, no matter if they get to the Western Conference Finals, get to the NBA Finals, no matter what happens, he's still going to be a top five point guard to me. A championship ring or not a championship ring is not going to take that away in my mind when it comes to be Chris, when it comes to Chris Paul being a top five guy, a top five point guard all time. Freddie, we agree because we basketball people. Yeah. But you know it's naive to act like this ring wouldn't make a difference, Freddie. You know it's not, naive. I, I don't believe in na- naivete. I just don't do that because I know that people will say stuff, Monica, just to have clickbait and all that stuff. You can't attach that to a Chris Paul if you're not looking at his numbers, if you're not looking at his impact. 11-time All-Star, six times All-Defensive team. Do you really need a championship ring to say, well, if he doesn't win a championship ring, boy, what a scrub he was all this time. All those plaudits don't mean anything. That's why I don't fall fall victim to that naive or naivete from people because I go by what I've seen. My eyes are pretty good at my age, and I've seen a guy that has been dominant as a point guard the minute he got out of Wake Forest when he was 20 years of age. Whether he wins a championship or not does not mean he's less of a point guard. We don't attach that to John Stockton. We don't attach that to Oscar Robinson only having one championship. So why are we doing that to Chris Paul just because he has not won a championship ring or gotten to the NBA Finals? Freddie, you're making too much sense now. You're making sense for us <laughs> basketball people who appreciate the position and appreciate the guy that sets the table just so. All I'm saying is you know it's a crowd out there. The rings mean the world, right? But I will That's say true. this. For, for Chris Paul, it, it was interesting to me to hear him say that he felt like he had been written off. I mean, I obviously am, am not necessarily in NBA circles in terms of front offices that may have written him off. But more than anything, myself and folks that I've been talking to as of late, you want to see him healthy, right? Like so often we've gotten into the playoffs and he has an untimely injury. And and I'm one of the folks that still wonders what if in terms of that Houston Golden State Warriors series. And so I agree with you. For me, he is definitely a top five point guard. I mean, you look, he's top or he's actually fifth on all time assist lead on the all time assist list. And that is quintessentially right. What we expect from our point guards to set everybody else up to run the team. And you look at what he's been able to do over the course of this series. While Devin Booker has been fantastic, while I think DeAndre Ayton is taking the next step in his ball game, and we've seen tremendous play from the supporting cast of the Phoenix Suns, Mikael Bridges, Cameron Payne, and so on and so forth. You take Chris Paul off of this squad? Mm-mm. None of this is going like this. I mean, you could really make an argument that the Lakers are poised to make a comeback in the fourth quarter of the waning games of that particular series. And so he gives this team such a tremendous gravitas in terms of anchoring them to the moment. And I love the relationship that he and Monty Williams said. Monty said last night, you know, Chris Paul was by his side in the worst moments of his life, his personal life. We all know about the tragedy um, with his wife. And then, of course, in the highest moments of his career. So we agree on Front Street that uh, (laughs) Chris Paul is definitely a top five point guard. 
But I do have an ear that will entertain those who say mm -hmm. the measuring stick is a ring. Now, cross your fingers, knock on wood, say prayers, whatever you got to do. Let Chris Paul stay healthy and get all the way to the finals. Absolutely. <laughs> well, here, Monica and Charlie, to your point, here's the deal. If we're going to attach rings as the ultimate legacy, then why are we talking about Robert Ory being one of the five greatest basketball players of all time? That conversation should never, ever come up. He was a key contributor, and people say he's a Hall of Famer. And I'm not buying the Hall of Fame thing. He was a part of seven championship teams. But we're not having that conversation when it comes to him saying, well, seven rings, that means he's the second greatest basketball player of all time to Bill Russell. How many conversations start who's the greatest basketball player of all time? It usually starts and ends and begins with Michael Jordan. And he has six rings, five behind Bill Russell, one behind Robert Ory. So when people try to use that ring argument in terms of greatness and legacy with a player, at a certain point, you got to run out and run into a mm -hmm. brick wall because there's certain guys in part of championship teams that have rings because they were satellite players, not because they were the best thing going for those basketball teams. We need a we need a and best. We're, we're role seeing player. that more than ever right now. What's that? We need a best role player category, best satellite player. Robert Horry is top <laughs> five easily. Well, in that Chris category. Paul is already making history. Last night he became the third player in NBA history to score 35 points in a postseason game at the age of 35 or older. The other two players to do so: Kareem and Carl Malone. Mm, good company. All right. Well, we have. Back in April, it was reported that reigning MVP Aaron Rodgers did not want to return to the Packers. Rodgers has spent his entire NFL career in Green Bay, but that being said, Rodgers was a no-show at the Packers' mandatory minicamp last week, the first time in his career, by the way. In first round, pick Jordan Love got the bulk of the work in team periods. Then, June 5th, in a piece on the Packers' website answering fan questions, Packers president Mark Murphy stated that, quote, the situation we face with Aaron Rodgers has divided our fan base. Then it was last Thursday at an event at Lambeau Field. Murphy spoke about Rodgers again and referenced the late Packers GM Ted Thompson, Thompson saying, quote, I'm often reminded, though, of Ted Thompson. As most of you know, just a great general manager. He passed away earlier this year, often talked about Aaron. And it wasn't just Aaron, a lot of different players, he would say. He's a complicated fella. So I'll just say that. A complicated fella. Okay, well, this guy, he's not too complicated. We like him. Swagoo Marcus Spears with us to talk about it. Uh, Monica, I want to start with you here. Where will Rogers play next season? Listen, Charlie, Swagoo, welcome to the show. It's so good to do a show with you, uh, Freddie. Here's my answer. Thank you, Ma. He, he will be in Denver. I, Aaron Rodgers is not playing with y'all. Like, I don't understand why we think that this is just going to be <laughs> Brush to the side because of money. If anybody has the cachet to work this thing out and not feel pressure because of their pockets, it's Aaron Rodgers. I continue to say that we are entering a different era of athletes, and the good brother Ryan Clark has discussed it. Football has sort of been one of those last groups to empower their players in this way in terms of them actually having weight that they can throw around yeah. to force their hands when it comes to decision. But, baby, it is here. Aaron Rodgers is not playing with y'all, so I completely think that he's going to be in Denver come next year. I'm going to quote my father, Freddie Coleman, Jr., Monica, Marcus, and Charlie. All prayers are answered. Sometimes the answer is no. And when it comes to staying up with Aaron Rodgers leaving Green Bay, that's not going to happen until next year. And here's why I say that. Let's, let's remember, he has not formally requested or asked for a trade. I mean, I know we've seen him in Hawaii on Instagram. We've seen him with Kenny Mayne oh, on Kenny Mayne's Freddie. Final Sports Center update. Oh, I know he's man. put – I mean, that stuff has been put out there. But he hasn't formally requested a trade. This is the sense I get. Starting September, week one, he'll be on the center for the Green Bay Packers. Mm. But it'll be game one of the last year that Aaron Rodgers is going to play in Green Bay because he has clearly made it cl plainly clear that he doesn't want to be there. And so he's not going to be there in 2022. He'll be under center 2021, have one last goal with his boys, a team that was a top-five offense last year, a team that got the NFC Championship game, and if Aaron Rodgers made a play or two, we're talking about Green Bay maybe being in the Super Bowl and not being in the NFC Championship game, but losing that NFC Championship game to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But in 2022, he's going to be somewhere else. But in 2021, he'll be under center for Green Bay. And by the way, word of advice to Mark Murphy, there's a way to handle negotiations and try to have a thawing out. This is not the way. Why you keep putting stuff out there that it's divided our fan base? He's a complicated fellow with the late Ted Thompson say, if you really want Aaron Rodgers to stay like the old slide in the family stuff, if you want me to stay, this is not the way to go about it, Mark Murphy. Why does he continue to talk, making things worse and worse and worse? It's just beyond description for me. Well, first, y'all, welcome to the Swaggoo Boom Boom Room. Okay, that's hey. where I am yeah, right now. Yeah, the vibes only. Hey. 
when I heard when I heard Stephen A. and Max wasn't gonna be on first take, and I knew it was Monica and Charlie and Freddie, I was like, "Good, we gonna have good vibes only." <laughs> and then Freddie started talking about all of this Green Bay stuff, uh -oh. and now here we go. Here we go, right? All of those things you just said, Freddie, you don't think Aaron Rodgers know that? Aaron Rodgers played in the NFC Championship last year and formally requesting a trade. Who the hell does that? They got people getting married sight unseen now on TV. So and, we and living in a new and, and world. how's that working Aaron for them, Rogers by the way? Aaron Rodgers is – it ain't working good. But I tell you this, they, they don't have a half a billion off. either. So, look, the point is – the point is when you start thinking about this entire situation, right, and everybody – like Shefty broke the news when we were down at the draft and everybody went crazy. This has been ongoing. I mm -hmm. keep screaming at the people, this is not new. The Green Bay Packers have, flied their, have flown their brass out to the West Coast to try to convince Aaron Rodgers to be happy and to, to do whatever they needed to do to get him back. Matt LaFleur on TV every day crying because he don't – don't know what the hell Jordan Love gonna do once he have to start a football game. This is over. Players are now in the vein. I'm, Mon, I'm glad you brought up what RC said because these dudes are starting to realize the type of cachet and the juice that they have, especially when you can withhold services and not worry about the check. Now, a guy like myself, if I would have went into Jerry Jones' office when I was playing for the Cowboys or Bashadi's office when I was with the Ravens and said, hey, I need y'all to do something while I'm out of here, they'd have packed my bags for me. I'd have been on the first thing smoking. But Aaron Rodgers can do that. Aaron Rodgers has done enough. He's proven that he's one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play this position. And Aaron Rodgers is absolutely controlling what is going to be the outcome. Now, I can see what Monica said with him being in Denver. Aaron Rodgers is going to be somewhere on the beach, chilling oh. with his Hollywood wife or fiance oh. until the call is made. Mark Murphy has just sent the messages out there that how they think of this guy. Right, so now both sides are unhappy with each other, and it's finally, mm -hmm. finally out in public, and I'm glad. Cause you know what, Charlie, I've been telling everybody for a damn year that Aaron Rodgers was gonna go get out of Green Bay, and everybody thought, oh no, it's the contract, and they owe him too much money, and oh, he's gonna lose so much money if he don't show up to camp. He ain't there. He ain't there right now. He ain't worried about this ninety-three thousand that he losing. So look. I'm going to go back to being calm because I'm so happy to be on with Monica and Freddie. <laughs> Freddie, my OG, who, who put me on radio before anybody did at, at, at ESPN, coming on with him and Fitz. And then Charlie with her first take, her take, moving up in the ranks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Shout, shout, shout it out. Shout it out. I'm going to get back to these good vibes only. But I'm telling y'all, Green Bay Packers and the Aaron Rodgers is over. It's over, y'all. Yeah. It's over. Stop holding on. Stop talking about the business of football. This is personal and it's with a guy that can absolutely dictate whether he show up or he doesn't show up because his pockets are straight. Not to be counting another man's pockets, but I wish they were mine. <laughs> I, I wish they were mine. I, I'm actually with you, Marcus, on this one. Monica, what else you have Listen, to I know we don't keep scoring the show, Freddie, but I'm going to go ahead and mark that one down for me. because Swagoo agrees with me. We're on the same page when it comes to this. The other thing I will say that, that I think is an interesting wrinkle in this conversation, you know, we had two big-time quarterbacks this past, or, or yeah, through the summer, or this offseason as we go through the summer, who voiced a little bit of displeasure. Well, Aaron Rodgers, not a little bit. Quite honestly, I don't want to go back. Uh, but I think back to the Russell Wilson deal. And while he... He played down the rumors that he wanted to leave Seattle, blah, blah, blah. The one thing I will say is that you had a Russell Wilson and a Pete Carroll relationship that has proven to be successful. When I think of this Aaron Rodgers deal, I think back to when Matt LaFleur got hired, right? And there were moments where it seemed like mm -hmm. there was tension between the two of them. Rodgers is an established entity in the NFL, and you bring in this young hotshot of a, of a coach who he may or may not always agree with. And so... The other part of this is, is the cachet. And while I know Aaron Rodgers loves his boys and um, that receiving core has gone to the mic and said that they've got Aaron Rodgers' back, to me, 
the absence of the cachet and the relationship with the head coach is another is another part of this. And another reason why I just I think Aaron Rodgers is serious. He about to be the one to make some mm-hmm. history and lay the precedent. All right, Monica and Marcus gang up on Freddie. No Christmas <laughs> presents for those two this year, 2021. Got it. All right, here's the deal. And you two, I hear what you two are saying in terms of this relationship is over. I just don't believe it's going to be over sooner than later because to Marcus's point, I know we got people out there doing 90-day fiancé and all that other stuff. These two have been together longer than 90 days. I'm talking about Aaron Rodgers and Mark Murphy, but I'm also talking about Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur. And Monica, you're right. When he first was on board, Aaron Rodgers wasn't on board with that. Mm-hmm. Two years into that, he says, man, Matt LaFleur, he can't even be more effusive about what he's been able to do with his career. Because to bring some memory to our memory, in the two years Aaron Rodgers has been under Matt LaFleur, uh, he's won an MVP. He's got an NFC championship game. Yeah. So that, they're not the problem. Aaron Rodgers and his teammates, that's not the problem. Aaron Rodgers in the city of Green Bay, that's not the problem. That's why I believe he's going to be starting in 2021. He's going to say, you know what? I'm going to be out of here anyway. He doesn't care about the $14.7 million that he's going to be paying the contract. Marcus, you're right. Money doesn't mean anything to Aaron Rodgers. He's already going to forfeit $2.5 million of salary because he's probably not going to be a training camp, at least early on. They could find him $50,000 a day. He looked at $93,000 and said, that's pocket money. I'm good not having that, not being at minicamp. But he also talked about how much he loves his teammates. And I think with a top five offense saying, you know, one more year instead of me starting over next year in the middle of essentially the season because they're going to trade him if they're going to do that before a training camp. So he's going to be behind the eight ball. If you're going to do that, be behind the eight ball starting over, do it next year in February if you get the Super Bowl or not because you have more cachet. You get one more year of your team. You, let's say you win the Super Bowl. Can you imagine what that's going to sound like and look like for Aaron Rodgers saying to Dick Green Bay, <laughs> see what I did? Good luck without me. That's why I still believe he'll have one more year at Green Bay and then move on after that and line his pockets with more gold because they will open up the bank vault the next stop he goes with the NFL after Green Bay and his turn is over. Marcus, you want to get the see, last Freddie, word? That's why you're a G. Cause, yeah, yeah, Freddie a G because he's optimistic. I'm not, okay? <laughs> I usually try to stay optimistic. I'm a pretty positive guy, but I ain't. This situation gone. And listen, I'm going to tell you this, man, from, from experience. Aaron Rodgers don't give a damn about them teammates. Aaron Rodgers handling his business. He was mm-hmm. on vacation while they was at practice. And he ain't worried about Jordan Love either. Because if he was, he would at least say something about Jordan Love. Because Jordan Love really getting the raw end of the deal. The Green Bay Packer fans are going to expect him to play well if this young kid is thrust into this role. He got a coach that's trying to build confidence without even knowing if he's going to have to play this year. There's a lot going on that Aaron Rodgers is, is, is dictating about the players on this roster that ain't in their in their best interest okay not saying that he got to handle his business and determine what he wants to do based on them but he is definitely not helping them at all because you know what all the questions they answering they answering questions about if Aaron Rodgers is going to be back and not how they going to look as a football team and look I got I got a little vibe from Adrian Amos when he was talking about it he said man look we got to come to work and we got to handle our business and we got to determine how what type of players we going to be because you know what I played for the Dallas Cowboys for eight years, and when them bills came in and when that check came in, ain't now one of them have Tony Romo name on it. So I had to take my butt to work and get what I had to get done and not be worried about that. And Tony Romo wasn't worried about my bills or my paycheck either. These guys have to figure out how to maneuver in this climate that they're in, and this climate was obviously created by Aaron Rodgers and his riff with the front office. So, yeah, all that love for teammates, all of that's nice to say, but the actions are about Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers, not the other dudes on this roster. Yeah, unfortunately, Freddie, I think it's three to one here. And, you know, Aaron Rodgers, he clearly feels betrayed. I mean, the 2020 Packers, the first team since the 2006 Cardinals to draft a quarterback in the first round while they have a former MVP quarterback on the team. You know, of course, that last team in 2006 being Matt Leinart and Kurt Warner on the Cardinals. So look, a little, bit of, a little bit of bad vibes here. We need the good vibes only, but we got to go. Marcus, thank you so much. And what do you say we talk about the possibility? Now up to the 40, 45 midfield. Foot race, 25, 20. Touchdown, Denver. Throws a deep ball to the right side. That ball fought for and caught. Jerry Judy, touchdown, Denver. What more can you say about the guy? You know, I, I think I've used up all the, the words in the vocabulary. 
And we now welcome in the Broncos' second-year standout wide receiver, Mr. Jerry Judy. And what perfect timing that we have you here because we had a conversation just now that we would love your input with because we were just talking about Aaron Rodgers and the situations that surrounding him in Green Bay. I'm sure you've heard about it. Uh, so there is a little bit of speculation that there's the potential that Denver could be in the mix for a landing spot for Rodgers should he decide not to stay with Green Bay. So I'm curious, how have you and your teammates, including Drew Locke, reacted to these rumors? And like, just give us a little glimpse into the group chat. What would we see? I mean, yeah, I mean, I heard some things about um, him potentially coming here, but I feel like we got two great quarterbacks and Drew and Teddy out here competing. And I'm excited to see what they do this upcoming year. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> but it's Aaron Rodgers. Come on. You wouldn't, you wouldn't kill to play with Aaron Rodgers? Yeah, of course. Of course. You know, you're a legendary quarterback. Um, excited play, uh, playmaker as a quarterback. It'll be fun, but as of right now, I can just control what I can control. There you go. Okay. There, that, I mean, that's, that's fair. That's, yeah, that's, he's got to stick with his teammates. All right. An absolutely professional answer, Jerry. It's not quite going to go viral the way that we might have hoped, but it works. <laughs> it's, speaking of things... <laughs> Speaking of things that did go viral, though, in the spring, we saw you running some sprints down the street in your neighborhood with your helmet on. Yeah. Now, we read that you were just trying to get an extra conditioning, but you got to yeah. explain this. Were you bored here, looking to make new friends? I mean, what actually was going on? Nah, so so what happened was I came, I came from working out, so I just got back home. I'm like, I, I feel like I needed a little bit more extra work, a little bit more conditioning. So I was like, man, I was with my dog. So I was like, let me just put my helmet on, run a little bit, and catch some, catch some football because I don't got you know, nothing to really do. That was really no, me. Was, yeah, know, no, like, di no diving catches on that pavement, right. though, right? <laughs> oh no, 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 it was none of that. I was just standing still. I was controlling it. None of that. <laughs> when was the last time that you just sprinted on pavement, though, Jerry? Did you feel that in your knees? Uh, no, not really. Uh, okay. Not really. Number one, I'm glad you were able to not get hurt running down your street. So that's number one. <laughs> number two, who did your shirt that you have on right now stay down until you come up? Who, who made that shirt for you? Oh, it's my boy Mo um, from the crib, Brown County. Uh, he got his own clothing line that he do called Humble Religion. I go check it out. Check it out on IG, Humble Religion. So how much of that with that shirt that you have on led to that video thinking, I'm always going to keep working, even though I was terrific as a rookie, two-time All-SEC, one of the best receivers in Alabama history. How much of that shirt represents you, not only on the football field, but also off the football field? Uh, you know, it represents me a lot. You know, you all want to stay down and focus on what your goals in life and, like, and work towards your goals in life. So it, it means a lot, you know, you want to stay down until you come up. So you want to work hard and do all the things you need to do to be successful in your life. Okay, 52 catches, 856 yards last season as a rookie, Jerry. What can the Broncos expect from you this upcoming season since you had a ridiculously good season last year? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say an average season, but, you know, you don't expect big things um, this year, you know, because I feel like I got a lot to prove this year. Um, and I hold myself to a high standard, so the standard that I played at last year, that's not the standard that I hold myself to. And I feel like this year, they got a lot to prove, and, I'm excited to see how it, see what happens. Older players, game films, and techniques and stuff, or are you more into highlight tapes and such? Uh, both, really. I'm, okay. When I was um, younger, I am mostly highlights, highlights, but now I'm lead. You know, you get all the different players in the league, um, targets and stuff, so I'm more be into that now. Okay, cool. So now that you, you've got the entire breadth of the study, I need to know... Your top three wide receivers currently in the NFL. Now, Wrinkle, you cannot include yourself, my dude, because I know you top, you one of one on your own list. But who are your top three guys you in the league? You have to be. Top three, I feel like everybody got their different ways of balling, so, and they came in different. So, but I like, me personally, I like route runners. So, I like guys like Calvin Ridley, uh, Amari Cooper, Stephon Diggs, Devontae Adams. Um, yeah, that's what, that's what that's my top. What's that, in the water down at Alabama, four. by the way? <laughs> you got you, Calvin Ridley, Julio Jones got this start, Nick Saban, you got Devontae Smith. Jerry, what is in the water down in Tuscaloosa <laughs> where also you turn around and they're great receivers time and time again coming out of that school? 
uh, you know, it's just a great program. You know, they develop players um, to become NFL NFL um, players. So, you know, Coach Sammy do a great job over there just to organize and bring in great talent. Um, and when you're surrounded by great talent, they nothing but but to become good. So just being able to be around those guys really motivates you to, to be the best player you could be. Okay, so Jerry, you're being rewarded for your amazing rookie season. You will have the first ever digital NFT rookie card. What's that like for you? I mean, these NFT cards are, are wild. So what does it feel like for you to have the first of its kind? Uh, it feels good. You know, I feel like it's just a new way to connect with fans. It also is, is big on me with um, a way to connect with Trisimian 18. So that's something that's something huge with me and my family that we deal with. Okay. All right, Jerry. Well, uh, look, we, I just have one other quick question. The, the off-season drama has mm -hmm. been something that all of us are talking about. Do, do you and the rest of your team follow it like the rest of us? Is this something that you, you get up and Google every morning? <laughs> uh, no, not really. You know, you, like, uh, uh, what, uh, exactly what you speaking on again? You said? What's up? What drama? You said what drama do I mean, with Aaron oh, Rodgers, like the, all that there's stuff. There's like the off-season drama. Oh. You know, we all get up and the first thing we're doing is Googling, seeing what's going on. Is that something you and your teammates do as well? Clearly not, Charlie. Oh, no, <laughs> okay, no, Jerry, no. don't <laughs> <laughs> No, no, we're, we're looking at all that. No, we're looking at all that. We just, all right, all right not here for the drama. <laughs> all right, well, that's good. Yeah. good. Fo focus on the game. That's all we need from you. Jerry, thank you so much for joining the show, and we wish you nothing but the best, regardless of who's throwing you the ball this upcoming season, although I know some of us – might be hoping, you know, maybe in, in some world it could be Aaron Rodgers. Hey, tell so your we'll people, send us a shirt. That's that's <laughs> why we bring people on TV. Let me get a shirt. <laughs> All right. Jerry, thank uh, you so you, much. I got you. Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, awesome. lots sure more. Oh, sorry, keep oh, going. Sorry, I'm just saying, y'all make sure y'all um, tune in to the NFTC drop, drop on June 29th. You, know, you can check it out on biscuit.com slash Jerry Judy. You can go on my page, at Jerry Judy, and link my bio. Okay. Flex the awesome. yeah, flex we love it. Jerry, NFC Jerry. <laughs> subtle plug, subtle plug. Yeah. All right, Jerry, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. We now have a tied series. Kyrie Irving left the game in the second quarter with a right ankle injury, and KD was held to 9 for 25 from the field. Here's Steve Nash following the game. Yeah, uh, Kai, uh, x-rays were negative, but uh, we'll have to see how it goes uh, tomorrow and further tests and, and treatment. Um, yeah, obviously, obviously we, we lost a great player uh, during the game, which was tough. We all got to pitch in. We all got to play together. We got to move the ball. And, and I thought tonight we got a little single-minded, looking for Kevin every time. Puts a little bit too much pressure on him. It makes us a little more predictable, I thought, um, you know, which, which puts a lot of burden on him. And look who we have joining us, Roz Gold on Wude joining First Take. And Roz, you know, it's, 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 it's really sad because there is the real possibility now that both James Harden and Kyrie Irving will be out for Game 5. So do you think, Roz, that Durant can win a game without the rest of the Big Three? Yes, I definitely think that it's possible for the Nets and Kevin Durant to win a game, win the series without Kyrie or without Harden. But, you know, I think one is going to take KD being great, but two, this is going to be a team-wide shift that's needed. First and foremost, this team has to be able to meet the Bucks. Intensity, physicality, toughness. They were out toughed by the Bucks in this game. The Bucks, starting with PJ Tucker, setting the tone, sacrificing his body, getting on the floor, getting in fights. He might have gotten away with some fouls too, but that's part of the game plan. Nobody's paying PJ Tucker to play pretty basketball. His job is literally to muck things up and hit corner threes. And he set that tone. So as a team, the Nets need to change their attitude and be tougher and more physical in the next game. And then the next thing I would say that's also important is going to be ball movement. If they're without Kyrie and Harden, they're without two top playmakers, guys that can create their own shots, create shots for others. So what's going to be key is ball movement, body movement. And all those role players, I don't want them out there just chucking up a bunch of shots in game five uh, of the playoffs. I want them to work harder to create easier and better shots for each other. Movement without the ball, ball movement, playing in pace, uh, beating a good physical Bucks defense down the court before they get a chance to be physical and set up with you, transition and some offense over defense, ball movement, attitude shift, and toughness. I think that's how they can do it. 
And see, and that's why I think it's a no. And Roz, I hear exactly <laughs> what you're saying from that standpoint. Because I don't trust that they're going to be able to do that. And we're putting a lot of pressure on Kevin Durant for obvious reasons. This is what he wanted to be a part of the Brooklyn Nets and have that kind of pressure. Think about this, ladies. This will be the most important game for Kevin Durant since Game 7 when he played for Oklahoma City against the Golden State Warriors when they had a 3-1 lead in that series. And in that game, he was terrific, but he was a playmaker but didn't have a lot of help. And the team that he had then is better than the guys he has right now without Kevin, without James Harden and without Kyrie Irving. That's why it's really incumbent upon Steve Nash. Kevin Durant can't just start and facilitate things. Get him to where he's going to do the most damage. Get him on the low block. Get him on isolations. And when they load up on him, you have to trust that guys will be able to make shots. I trust that Kevin Durant is going to be terrific. He's going to make a lot of plays for himself and try to make plays for other people. I just don't trust those guys that they'll be able to do that. And that's why I don't believe he can win another game in this series without James Harden and Kyrie Irving because I trust Kevin Durant enough to make plays but enough with other guys to raise their level and do that. That's why I don't think he'll be able to do it in this series against the Milwaukee Bucks. Freddie, you don't trust these guys to move the basketball? I mean, let's not forget that the big three actually only play, what, seven games together? We've said it all year round. They've been on the floor without their star power. I think Roz laid it out perfectly. Attitude adjustment and ball movement. To me, moving the basketball is quintessentially one of the simplest things to do in the game. And if you're asking me, can they execute an offense that includes some more motion so that ultimately it still ends up in the hands of Kevin Durant? I think that they can handle that. The, the idea that this team cannot step up to the occasion in terms of playing tougher, to me, Freddie, like that's, that's wild, bro. Like they can play tougher. There's another, another level to go. And all of a sudden, we're acting like this Milwaukee Bucks team has been steamrolling the Brooklyn Nets this entire series. They are not that far removed from looking like the gum on the bottom of your shoe when you're walking through New York City. And I just don't buy that they are suddenly that consistent, and there's no way for this Brooklyn Nets squad to match them in terms of tough toughness and something as simple as ball movement. I even, yeah. I even think that they can bring the defensive int intensity to support Kevin Durant. To one game, Freddie? Ross said series. I don't know if I can get with series, but one game? Well, they can get the, one game. Well, here's to your point about one game. After game two, what were we saying about the Bucks? when they lost by 39. People said they had no chance of winning the series. Mm -hmm. So we're going to use the one-game theory. Then we got applied to both of these situations here. All of a sudden, you're trying to tell me that, okay, one game later, that the Brooklyn Nets are going to find their shooting stroke, and you're thinking that Landry Shamet, Joe Harris, who's, been terrific, who's not been terrific in this series, other people are going to step up. That's asking a lot of those guys because we have to remember the genius of Kyrie Irving and James Harden. You can overcome James Harden. You still have Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant on your basketball team. But not having both of those guys and say, hey, Kevin Durant, go out there and lead the way, and we got Mike Jones, we Freddie, got we've Blake Griffin, spoiled. and all those guys. We've been you, can, spoiled, you can have all the though. ball movement you want, but if guys aren't making shots, then it doesn't matter. And then you we, play right Freddie, in the hands of Milwaukee Bucks. This on, is more Roz, about the Brooklyn Nets, not the Milwaukee Roz, Bucks. Talk to no, him me, about let KD's let me, greatness. Can, talk to him, Rob. Let, let, please talk to him. Let me tag in, sis. Can I tag? Woo. Yeah, please. You win. Go. <laughs> no, but um, Freddie, like, this is a team that has only seen KD, Kyrie, and Harden play eight total games together this season. It's not like any of this is brain surgery or something brand new to them, suddenly having to step up and deliver. Without those big three even being on the court together, they still manage to be second in the East. You well, know, you bring up Joe different. Harris, who has yet... You have bring up Joe Harris, who has yet to find his stroke in this series. I think he's shooting just above 20% in this series. He's supposed to be one of the top three-point shooters in the whole league. I think the types of shots that are being created are important, and how they're creating good and hunting for great shots is important. And I keep coming back to ball movement. Basketball is a simple team game. Mm -hmm. You look at the two wins that the Nets had. They, are, they were averaging like 27, 26 assists per game. And the two losses, they're way down around 72, 17 assists. You know, so you're talking about a difference in play creation and also creating some offense off of defense, making the game easier for each other. And then to come back to defending Kevin Durant, when you look at the way they were running offense once Kyrie was out, Coach Nash said it himself. The team looked predictable. They were giving a rock to KD, and it kind of looked like, please make something happen, Kevin. And the problem is, is that the Bucks have personnel. First of all, P.J. Tucker is physical on him. That's the first line of defense. The second line of defense is also big and long. Chris Middleton or Brooke Lopez waiting for him. There's so much size and physicality working hard, all focused on KD. Almost all his shots were contested, hard, foul. He was on the floor. He's getting yelled at. You know, Covington's bleeding. This is a physical matchup. So it's not only creating better shots for each other. And to your point, you're like, well, let's set up KD more. 
as great as KD is, you still got to help make the shots more in rhythm and easier for him as well. Roz, I hear you, but you're not playing a regular season game. This is playoff pressure in a game five that's going to feel like a game seven. So based on what you and Monica are trying to convince me, and let me give you credit, you're not convincing me at all, but it's a nice try to both of you. In this situation, I, I expect Kevin Durant to be great. I expect Kevin Durant to get 35 and 40. But where's the other 20? Where's the other 15? Where's the other 18 going to come from? With those guys that he has right now, part of this basketball team in this series with that playoff pressure going into game five, and I know they're playing at home, that is asking a lot of those guys. You guys are exactly right. You ladies are exactly right. Ball movement, creating better shots. But are we really trusting Blake Griffin to make those shots? Are we one trusting Joe game, in this Freddie, that's the thing for me. One game. Yeah, it's one Blake, game. Blake one game. Griffin hasn't made shots the whole series. So you can hey, add that. He, he's made a couple of shots here and there. You didn't he got say blocked. one person had the 18. You just Monica, had to have 18. You Monica, said we got to come a, up he, with it. Monica, he had, a, he had a play yesterday where he is going to the rim. He sees Lopez, they and he did a yesterday. 180 to throw the ball back to somebody who's all through the ball out of bounds. If he's doing that and not trusting himself, also we're going to trust Blake Griffin to do that in the game five? You can have that faith all you want. I'm not having that faith at all. Blake okay. Griffin has been full of surprises in this series. You, we found Bob. out he can still jump. We found out he can still defend. This is great uh, news. And we found he doesn't want to dunk against against on tall people getting into the rim, too. We found that out, too. Okay, well, look, the, the Nets, Freddy. they're 9-6 and six <laughs> when one member of the big three plays that since James Harden's debut with the team. Now, that being said, last night makes the first time within this postseason, also the regular season, that the Nets neglected to score 100 points in back-to-back -back games. So they definitely will have their work cut out for them, especially if KD is the only one on the floor of that big three. All right, Roz, thank you so much. Thanks, Viv. Always so appreciate good to you. Be. Let's go. It's time for quick takes. You each have 25 seconds. Here we go. Some mini camps are underway. Let's make some predictions. Freddie, you're up first. Who wins the NFC East? To me, it's going to be the Dallas Cowboys, mainly because I trust that with Dak Prescott coming from his injury, I trust that offense more than anybody else's offense in that division. And the Washington football team, they have the best defense in that division. But I think that Cowboys offense, the way it played before Dak Prescott got injured last year, I think they have a more of a trust factor with me to win the NFC East this year. Mm. Monica? Uh, you, you... Oh, never mind. You, you got the next one. Bill Belichick reloaded in free agency this offseason after missing the playoffs for the first time since 2008. Monica, do they make it back this season? Yes, they do, Charlie. But also, Freddie, put some respect on my Washington football team. They are coming for that division. Here's why the <laughs> Patriots will be back in the playoffs. Because Cam Newton will have a full offseason regime, and we heard him talk so candidly about wanting to stay under Bill. Plus, the league-high eight COVID opt-outs are back, and we saw what they did in free agency. Death, taxes, and Bill figuring out a way to win. <laughs> Freddie, who is your MVP favorite? Uh, the biggest, baddest boy in the NFL jungle, and that guy's Patrick Mahomes, the quarterback at Kansas City. And he, I think he's only going to get better because that offensive line is going to be a lot healthier. We know what kind of weapons they have on the outside. And I don't think, I don't think he scratched the surface how great he's going to be, which is strange to say, but he's only going to get better. I think he's going to get his second MVP award. I think he gets that this year. Patrick Mahomes, the quarterback in Kansas City. Okay, not a bad choice. And speaking of Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey, he was back in his home state of Ohio. He was participating in the Jarvis Landry Celebrity Softball Game. And although his Chiefs have been to the Super Bowl the last two years, he, he thinks the Browns aren't far behind. Take a listen. I would say they're definitely a contender, without a doubt. I mean, it's definitely there. Uh, Baker and the gang have, uh, have up the ante, made this team an uh, unbelievable team and a, and a team you have to prepare for and take serious. And, um, you know, I think that uh, moving forward, without a doubt, I can see a lot more playoff games between us. And, um, you know, I'll just take it one day at a time and, and, and hope for it. But I think that, uh, you know, the, the Browns and Chiefs are definitely uh, neck and neck for sure. Neck and neck. Okay. Lewis Riddick here with us. Lewis, thanks for being here. Now, everybody, keep in mind, mm -hmm. Travis is from the Cleveland area. So, Freddie, are you buying or selling Kelsey's comments that they're neck and neck? Well, if he was running for mayor of Cleveland, he went in a landslide based on that whole thing, <laughs> being part of the Chamber of Commerce event <laughs> that he was at. But I, I'll still take the Buffalo Bills over the Cleveland Browns. And this is the best thing about the Cleveland Browns' this conversation. We're not talking about the Cleveland Browns being a national joke. It seems they've come that far that soon being a team that you think about and say, yeah, I could see that team challenging the AFC. But I got Kansas City one, I got Buffalo two, and I got Cleveland number three. Miles Garrett is going to have another terrific season. That offense is going to be really good. We've heard reports about OBJ, Odell Beckham Jr. look fantastic in camp so far. 
But that Bills team, they believe they can beat Kansas City. I think Cleveland thinks they can beat Kansas City. Buffalo believes, man, if we get that team again, we play them two knockdown, drag out battles, one in the regular season, the AFC Championship game. We believe we're a lot closer to Kansas City Chiefs than the Cleveland Browns are. So I'll take the Buffalo Bills, but that line between the Bills and the and the and the Cleveland Browns is very, very thin. Both of these teams are really, really good in the AFC. I think we do this thing as Yeah, I think a lot of Go, Lewis. No, please. Oh, okay. All right. Here, I'll just say this real quickly. I think there's a bunch of teams that have really closed the gap on Kansas City. Buffalo, obviously, is already right there. They have fortified this roster a little bit this offseason. Namely, their two young draft picks are going to have to really come through for them on the defensive line. Greg Rousseau is going to have to be huge. Carlos Basham needs to be huge because that's what hurt them in the AFC title game. They couldn't close the game. They couldn't get to Patrick Mahomes. That's a problem for them. Cleveland is going to be there. They've already set the floor as far as what there's what success looks like for them in 2021. It's the divisional round or bust. They need to get higher than that. They need to get to the AFC Championship game. They need to get to the Super Bowl. 1 through 53, if you look at Cleveland's roster, it stacks up with anybody in the NFL. We're not just talking about in the in the AFC. Anyone in the NFL. They've got strength along both lines offensively and defensively. Strong running, running game can play the black and blue type of football if you need to late in the season. They've got perimeter weaponry with a lot of speed and a lot of versatility on offense. They got on this, you know, on the defensive side, they improved their speed at linebacker with the draft, drafting of Jeremiah Wusi Kormo from Notre Dame. They've got one of the best secondaries in the NFL on paper. Now, if all these guys that they brought in, guys like John Johnson from the Rams, and if Grant Delpit can come back from injury, Troy Hill from the Rams, if these guys can play, and they can all get on the same page. Cleveland's right there, man. The, the AFC is tight now. It's very tight at the top. And let's not forget the Baltimore Ravens, too. So, look, Travis is on to something. He knows that Cleveland is for real. For real. He saw how close they had him on the brink, or rather had him on the cusp last year, of defeat. So let's just see what happens here. But I, I think Cleveland is for real, no question. I mean, Lewis, if you say that the division has gotten tighter, then 100%. I mean, I would not counter what you said. But what I will say is you got to take that whole thing in mind. At Jarvis Landry's fantasy event, he was going to say, yeah, they improved, but they still can't touch us. No, Travis Kelsey was not going to say that. He completely <laughs> understood the setting in which yeah. he was in. But I also think in general, what we see there is something that athletes understand. And I think sometimes as consumers of sports from the outside looking in, we forget. It is hard to win games. Whether you're talking NFL, MLB, NBA, you name it. It is hard to win games and to win at a consistent level. And while the Chiefs have been excellent, excellent, and I was of the camp that we are taking Patrick Mahomes for granted, he should have been the MVP last year as well. The When you set the bar, there's only a matter of time before everybody else is trying to meet your bar. And so... Yeah, Cleveland probably improved, as did some other teams in the league, but I don't know that I buy neck and neck. If Kansas City continues to play the way that we've seen and make adjustments accordingly, as we saw them do post the loss in the Super Bowl to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I, I, I'm still confident that if it came down to a very tight ball game, but the ball was in Patrick Mahomes' hands at the end, I'm taking the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. Lewis, I want to I wanna throw this question at you, Lewis, because I look at Kansas City. If anything, their division is going to help them because I believe the Raiders have regressed. The Chargers are still a couple of years away. And the Denver Broncos, we don't know what's going to happen. You look at Cleveland's division. You got Pier 6 brawls. It's four times a year where you got the Pittsburgh yeah. Steelers and the Baltimore Ravens. And anytime they play the Cincinnati Bengals, that always feels like, you know, last person standing match in wrestling from that standpoint. You got the new, you got also the Buffalo Bills. We know the Patriots are going to be better. The Miami Dolphins last year were a 10 win football team. They believe they're going to be better to a tongue by Loa. If anything can have Kansas City maybe increase the gap a little bit more is that their divisional games won't be as difficult as the divisional games that Cleveland Browns and the Buffalo. Bills are going to play, Lewis. What about that? Yeah, look, I, I agree with you there. When you're talking about divisional titles, yeah, I mean, I think Kansas City is still obviously the cream of the crop in the West, and that the other three haven't really made enough significant headway on them. And I'll say this also about Kansas City. Look, I'm, I'm not trying to discount their improvement that they have made this offseason too, Freddie, because I'll tell you this. Yeah. Their offensive line, if one through five, this offensive line plays as good as it looks on paper, this could be the most explosive version of the Kansas City offense since Patrick Mahomes took over. Because now they will wow. be able to own the line of scrimmage, mm -hmm. run the football with effectiveness whenever they want to, and you know they could, they're going to still be able to throw it. And defensively, they've gotten better too. They've gotten better up front. 
They are more, they are consistent as far as the construction of their staff. Haven't lost anybody. Things remain the same on that side of the football. This is a football team that's gotten better. There's no doubt about that. I'm just saying, though, that the Clevelands, the Baltimores, the, the New Englands, the Miamis, they've all closed the gap. And I'll tell you this. Once they get out of divisional play, once Kansas City gets out of divisional play, it's anybody's guess. All these teams are right in there, and they're neck and neck. And, you know, I think Travis is on to something there, and he realizes it. The, the AFC is top-heavy, man, and it's going to be fun to watch. It is going to be fun to watch. And you know what? Let's give the Browns credit where it's due. They ended two major droughts this past season, making the playoffs for the first time since 2002, winning a playoff game for the first time since two. Wow. And John Morant, he just said two words, but they spoke very loudly. He said, league <laughs> soft. Okay, Freddie, what do you say? Is the league soft? The NBA is not soft. The NBA is what the NBA is. And the reason that people will use that word soft is because they're so used to what happened when they grew up watching basketball in the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. The NBA has made sure they're going to legislate, and they have legislated, slug it out, clutch and grab basketball. So anything that goes beyond that pale, because the referees have been instructed to make sure the game does not get out of hand. Now, let's be honest, ladies. Players don't want to fight. There's way too much money. If a dude wants to fight, that means he's more of a G League player than the NBA player. He's not going to be around long. But in this situation, after the referees, I thought they allowed the rules of engagement in the NBA to override the decision making. When did sense be taken out of the equation? They have no Nik- Nikola Jokic, Jokic, excuse me, making a play in the basketball. And yes, it was a play that was beyond the pale. But a flagrant two, to me, at worst, it should have been a technical foul. You shoot two free throws, boom, let's play basketball. But the league is not too soft because the NBA has made it a point to say, we're going to allow players to be basketball players. You shouldn't have to go to a weight room and be a better basketball player or be a better defender. But I honestly thought that the rules of the NBA, because people say it's soft because what they saw last night, they say, well, back in the day, back when we were just roaming the earth as old people playing basketball (laughs) and we didn't want these kind of things to happen. All of a sudden now, this is not part of the NBA and people thinking we liked it better. Did you really like it better when games were 70 to 69, 80 to 79, and shooting percentages no more than 40%? Give me this. I thought the referees were overzealous with the call, but I will say this. The NBA is not soft. The NBA is what it is, and I don't mind the NBA being this kind of NBA in this day and age. It is particularly interesting, Freddie and Charlie, that uh, Trey Young and John Morant, who I love, shout out to Memphis, who showed love after I picked the Memphis Grizzlies to beat the, Phoenix, or beat the Golden State Warriors. You were um, the only one. Uh, you, you know. You know, I'm here. Like, I'm here. We here. Um, <laughs> we here. <laughs> the, it's interesting that these two guys chimed in on this, right? They are two slight point guards, right? Mm-hmm. That they're not big guys. Um, ja goes to the rim with reckless abandon and could care less who was waiting for him on the other side. And, of course, Trey is one that draws the commentary, that's not a foul or that's not basketball, very often because of his ability to hunt for fouls and opportunities to get to the free throw line. So it's interesting hearing this from them. I I do agree with you, Freddie, in that I take a little bit of issue with the word soft. The game obviously now has been uh, catered to the offensive players, and we love high-scoring affairs. Uh, In this moment, it felt to me that Nikola Jokic was being treated as a player who has a reputation of dirty plays. Now, technically, because my folks on flagrant two, as I may read really quickly, unnecessary and excessive contact committed by a player against an opponent, right? Right. It was a basketball play. Right. Yes, he was frustrated. There was a little bit of a wind-up, but it was a basketball play. Nikola Jokic is trying to slap the ball away from campaign. I also think that we have to be mindful of looking at things in slow motion, right? Because if, if my face turned right now, Freddie, and I gave you a mean side eye, like, <laughs> in slow that. motion? You don't want that. Listen, it's going to look way more intense than in yeah. real time, and so I think... While technology is designed for us to get the best look possible, I agree with you that we've taken a little bit of judgment out of the game. And I'm the daughter of a referee, right? Mm -hmm. I do think that it is unfortunate that in this moment, you're talking about your MVP and elimination game. It was a, what, it was 85-73? It was an eight-point ball game at that point. I got the score wrong, but it was an eight-point ball game. It is unfortunate to me that the stripes have become a part of the conversation about what should have been maybe the Nuggets' opportunity to avoid getting swept. So I don't know that I would agree with the league is soft, but right. I do think that that call lacked a little bit of t- a tact and, and reading the room in terms of the moment. Yeah, Use your head if you're an NBA referee because we know this, and we can say this out loud. If campaign had done that to Nikola Jokic, he's not being thrown out of this game. This is a case of a bigger man 
against a smaller player, mm-hmm. and they saw that. It reminded me so much of Shaquille O'Neal when somebody said, well, Shaquille O'Neal can take getting fouled. I'm thinking, well, a foul's a foul. I don't care if you're eight foot two or two foot eight. A foul is still a foul. Just because he's a big man doesn't mean he should have to endure more punishment from smaller people beating up on him. I thought this was a reverse situation. If Nikola Jokic was the same size as campaign, let's say he was Devin Booker. There's mm-hmm, no way that mm-hmm. Devin Booker's thrown out of this game. And to be fully honest, even if Kola Jokic stays in the game, they're still getting swept because Phoenix was that good in the fourth quarter. At one point, Chris <laughs> Paul made nine straight shots. Yeah. They ran the same play. They ran the, what I call the DOI offense, ladies. Definition of insanity. They ran the same mm. thing over and over again. And Denver says, we well, that. it worked the first seven times. It won't work number eight. Well, it worked the first eight times. It won't work number nine. So they wouldn't have won this series or got not avoided being swept, even if Kola Jokic's on the floor. But I thought he was the punishment uh, because he was a bigger guy. Cameron Payne is not a bigger mm-hmm. guy. And I thought they took that rule too literally to the point it should have just been a flagrant one, technical foul, two free throws, and let's play basketball. Yeah. Well, if you were on Twitter, you, you saw what Stephen A. had to say about this call by the refs. He was not about it. <laughs> uh, now the Joker is only the second MVP to be ejected from a postseason game. Steph Curry was the first back in the 2000, 2016 NBA Finals. You remember he took his mouthpiece out, threw it into the stands. It hit a fan. So... This is only the second player in 25 seasons, by the way, to have that happen. All right, now we move on because the Joker's absence led to some smooth sailing for the Suns, who swept the Nuggets out of the playoffs 123-98. to Chris Paul, he did the damn thing. The 36-year-old went off for 37 points. He's now just four wins away from his first ever NBA Finals appearance. Chris was saying before the game, he, he ain't never sw- swept somebody. Um, he ain't never beat anybody 4-0. Um, and I don't know when the last time the Suns have been to the Western Conference Finals, but, you know, tonight is one of them nights that, you know, we celebrate in-house and then, you know, we wake up tomorrow and, you know, we're on to either the Clippers or, or Utah. A couple years ago, they was writing me off, you can't do this, and this ain't about me, it's about us. Show you what you can do when you come together as a team. we got a great team over there, and it's a lot of, a lot of fun to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Chris Paul, you got to love him. Yeah. You saw the hug he gave to Monty Williams after the game. That was, that was something. Uh, Freddie, I have to ask you, though, would Chris Paul be a top five point guard of all time should he win a chip? No, because he's a top five point guard already now, whether he wins a championship or not. Okay. I don't think a <laughs> ring. I don't think a ring is going to make him less of a top five point guard or more of a top five point guard. And I get it. People always attach championship rings to people's legacy. How many did you win? How many did you not win? Well, John Stockton is in my top five point guards of all time. He didn't win a championship ring. Isaiah Thomas, one of the greatest point guards ever. I split hairs between him and Chris Paul. I got between four and five. I got Magic one, Oscar two, Stockton three. Then I got a tie between Chris Paul and also um, and also Isaiah Thomas. I'll split, the, I'll split the difference. I think Isaiah Thomas is number four and Chris Paul is number five. But whether they win a championship or not, you can't discount what he's been able to do no matter where he's been, whether he was drafted by New Orleans or with the Clippers, and they blamed him for their fall. The Houston Rockets, they tried to blame him for that fall when it wasn't his fault. At the same time, the fact that he's been able to do this when people were trying and determined to write him off three, four, five years ago, he was a top five point guard, period, to me. So no matter what he does, no matter if they get to the Western Conference Finals, get to the NBA Finals, no matter what happens, he's still going to be a top five point guard to me. A championship ring or not a championship ring is not going to take that away in my mind when it comes to, be Chris, when it comes to Chris Paul being a top five guy and a top five point guard all time. Freddie. We agree, because we basketball people. Yeah. But you know it's naive to act like this ring wouldn't make a difference, Freddie. You know it's not, naive. Well, I, I don't believe in na- naivete. I just don't do that. Because I know that people will say stuff, Monica, just to have clickbait and all that stuff. You can't attach that to a Chris Paul if you're not looking at his numbers, if you're not looking at his impact. 11-time All-Star, six times All-Defensive team. Do you really need a championship ring to say, well, if he doesn't win a championship ring, boy, what a scrub he was all this time. All those plaudits don't mean anything. That's why I don't fall fall victim to that naive or naivete from people because I go by what I've seen. My eyes are pretty good at my age, and I've seen a guy that has been dominant as a point guard the minute he got out of Wake Forest when he was 20 years of age. Whether he wins a championship or not does not mean he's less of a point guard. We don't attach that to John Stockton. We don't attach that to Oscar Robinson only having one championship. So why are we doing that to Chris Paul just because he has not won a championship ring or gotten to the NBA Finals? Freddie, you're making too much sense now. You, you're making sense for us <laughs> basketball people who appreciate the position and appreciate the guy that sets the table just so. All I'm saying is you know it's the crowd out there. The rings mean the world, right? But I will That's say true. this. For, for Chris Paul, it, it was interesting to me to hear him say that he felt like he had been written off. I mean, 
I obviously am, am not necessarily in NBA circles in terms of front offices that may have written him off. But more than anything, myself and folks that I've been talking to as of late, you want to see him healthy, right? Like right. so often we've gotten into the playoffs and he has an untimely injury. And, and I'm one of the folks that still wonders what if in terms of that Houston Golden State Warriors series. And so I agree with you. For me, he is definitely a top five point guard. I mean, you look, he's top or he's actually fifth on all time assist lead on the all time assist list. And that is quintessentially right. What we expect from our point guards to set everybody else up to run the team. And you look at what he's been able to do over the course of this series. While Devin Booker has been fantastic, while I think DeAndre Ayton is taking the next step in his ballgame, and we've seen tremendous play from the supporting cast of the Phoenix Suns, Mikael Bridges, Cameron Payne, and so on and so forth. You take Chris Paul off of this squad? Mm -mm. None of this is going like this. I mean, you could really make an argument that the Lakers are poised to make a comeback in the fourth quarter of the waning games of that particular series. And so he gives this team such a tremendous gravitas in terms of anchoring them to the moment, and I love the relationship that he and Monty Williams said. Monty said last night, you know, yeah. Chris Paul was by his side in the worst moments of his life, his personal life. We all know about the tragedy um, with right. his wife. And then, of course, in the highest moments of his career. So we agree on Front Street that uh, <laughs> Chris Paul is definitely a top five point guard. But I do have an ear that will entertain those who say mm -hmm. the measuring stick is a ring. Now, cross your fingers, knock on wood, say prayers, whatever you got to do. Let Chris Paul stay healthy and get all the way to the finals. Absolutely. <laughs> well, here, Monica and Charlie, to your point, here's the deal. If we're going to attach rings as the ultimate legacy, then why are we talking about Robert Ory being one of the five greatest basketball players of all time? That conversation should never, ever come up. He was a key contributor, and people say he's a Hall of Famer. And I'm not buying the Hall of Fame thing. He was a part of seven championship teams. But we're not having that conversation when it comes to him saying, well, seven rings, that means he's the second greatest basketball player of all time to Bill Russell. How many conversations start who's the greatest basketball player of all time? It usually starts and ends and begins with Michael Jordan. And he has six rings, five behind Bill Russell, one behind Robert Ory. So when people try to use that ring argument in terms of greatness and legacy with a player, at a certain point, you got to run out and run into a mm -hmm. brick wall because there's certain guys in part of championship teams that have rings because they were satellite players, not because they were the best thing going for those basketball teams. We need a we need a and best role player. We're seeing that more than ever right now. What's that? We need a best role player category. Best satellite player. Robert Horry is top <laughs> five easily. Well, Chris category. Paul is already making history. Last night he became the third player in NBA history to score 35 points in a postseason game at the age of 35 or older. The other two players to do so, Kareem and Carl Malone. Mm, good company. All right. Well, we 